Good evening, everybody out there on YouTube. I'm Dr. Bosworth, and it is Sunday night. I have had, uh, this is start number two, so hopefully you can see that. I am looking uh, for anybody that can hear me. So um, the last time it, there was no sound, so I'm just going to wait to see if I can hear. Um, there you are. Sound is good now. Awesome. Okay. So let's repeat what I was saying to myself. See, you think it's funny, um, but uh, you really do have uh, the ability to speak to yourself uh, on these things until the audience corrects you. So thank you for being there. Thank you for everybody, for the patients. Um, I'm Dr. Bosworth. I am an internal medicine physician, and I try to come to you live every Sunday night with some teachable moments uh, and some uh, advanced education about the ketogenic diet. Um, I have been practicing with a ketogenic diet for over three years now, and my first and very foremost patient was my mother, who had been fighting cancer for over 10 years. She was faced with a choice uh, that um, had uh, no, um, no room for, for error and had uh, a really high cancer count. Uh, an aged body beyond her years. So even though she was 71, her body was acting closer to late 90s. And my goodness, um, she said, I'm not gonna choose chemo. I've gotta find a different way to do this. I feel terrible every time I do a round of this, I become less human. So together, uh, we, uh, I said, mom, let me show you what I would do. Uh, that's what this book has been all about. Uh, I wrote the lessons for my mom, kept them in a little notebook, and thanks to the encouragement of my husband, probably to the tune of over 500 times, saying, you should write a book about that. You should write a book about that. Uh, that's what it took to push print, and uh, the rest has kind of been history about using my education for how I'm helping patients with chronic illness, uh, in particular, um, inflammatory things that uh, have high sugars, like cancer, but also um, just joint pain and arthritis and diabetes and an immune system that's not so good. So welcome to Sunday night. I have a really great story for you tonight, um, mainly connecting to what I think is one of the most important things. If you want to do keto for the long haul, if you want to see the journey, uh, for the long game, then tune in tonight. That's what we're going to talk about. Just uh, a few other um, housekeeping. The comments are working tonight and the sound. Uh, I love seeing where you guys are from. Thank you so much. It is encouraging to me to do this when I see that even if I mess it up, uh, folks will have forgiveness and they are able to just learn through uh, the education on this classroom called YouTube. Um, I really have uh, seen a tremendous um, attraction to folks buying the book and really learning from that, those lessons in the last probably month. <laughs> like It's been out for about 18 months, um, about 18 months. And I am just, I think it is people trying to unpack and really get into what, what is it about the ketogenic diet that um, can really be life-giving. And, um, you know, the subtitle of my book is Ketones for Life. And I really mean that as the journey of how can you stay on a ketogenic diet, but also the restoration of how we can heal your cells from the mitochondria up uh, when you stop having high inflammatory markers, high levels of inflammation, and those um, evil free radicals that run around and cause havoc in our DNA and our cells. So um, I'm just going to do start out with a little bit of an update from Jerry, who two weeks ago Jerry wrote in and uh, showed quite an improvement in his um, his aging body, but ha has um, was able to drop 70 pounds in, since he started the ketogenic diet about the first of the year, about Christmas time and really has taken his sugars from in the mid 200s, like 250, 260 down to about 210. Um, this was uh, great because so many of his inflammatory markers were better. He has really reversed a lot of his, um, his symptoms of neuropathy and his brain wasn't working right. And as, uh, as he got in front of his physician, he was a little miffed that his doctor wasn't even wasn't more proud and, or more encouraging uh, because he'd lost all the weight. But his doctor was focused on the hemoglobin A1C or some of the lab tests, which are really important. So if you haven't checked out those episodes, these last two weeks have been really unpacking Jerry's story, using those labs to teach so many people. I had probably dozens of people write in saying this explained so much about how 
And by write in, I mean they are on YouTube comments, tr which I'm trying to keep up with them, um, saying this really did help me understand what why the hemoglobin A1C is so important to physicians. Um, that's more than just measuring your blood sugar. It's measuring how well can your body deliver the repair process. Uh, and uh, boy, if you haven't checked those out, I will tell you they have great numbers associated with them because it was a very attractive lesson to people, I suppose. So if you, um, if you heard last week, we kind of checked in that I said if, if Jerry really wants to improve his, uh, his numbers, we, he has a problem. He still has really high blood sugars. So I encouraged him to um, not go four days with fasting, but really do instead of an OMAD, which is one meal a day, I encouraged him to try one meal every other day. And uh, although that sounds a bit striking when you first uh, uh, hear that, uh, his numbers were at that brink of saying we just need a little uh, help to empty out the storage for what Jerry had done over the last uh, probably three or four decades of having high sugars. And I would have never told Jerry to do that on his first couple of months of keto. He is seven months into this. His body is adapted. He checks his numbers. Uh, really uh, had some safety things of watching how well he has progressed. And he really doesn't want to go back on insulin. Uh, we're hoping we can uh, show him how to do that. Um, so Jerry has a spreadsheet that I use with the folks I coach. Uh, and he, he is filling it out. He's also traveling, so he trialed, tried the every other meal per day. Uh, and, and he did pretty good. His numbers showed that he was doing good, but he's run into some, some struggles of how do you do this when I'm around other people that they eat every day. <laughs> they eat more than once a day. Uh, and just the struggles of how to, how to watch uh, that um, progression of strength. So that brings me to tonight's story, which uh, is not about Jerry. We're going to wait for Jerry to give us some data over the next few weeks, and we'll give you a follow-up on him. So stay tuned on Sunday nights. Uh, Jerry, I just want to say thank you for sharing your story, allowing me to use your journey to teach other people, because it is one of the most common questions that I get. You know, Doc, I've been fasting, and my sugars are still high. What does that mean? What do I do? Um, so just saying um, we'll get you followed up on that the longer we go. So I just want to say hi to a few people. There's somebody from Park City, Utah, and I just have to say hi, Teresa. Um, I don't know her personally, but I am saying hello because I lived there when I first uh, was in residency. My husband and I expected to stay in Utah for just my residency, which would have been three years. We ended up staying in Utah for a decade, a wonderful place to do medicine and also just be in a family-centered uh, environment. Um, but we've moved back to South Dakota in 2007, so we have been back to South Dakota for as long as we were away um, and have really uh, um, missed, you know, we used to vacation, every vacation home to South Dakota to see family, and now we've often said we should go back to Utah just to see the beautiful place that we moved to. Seems like forever ago. Uh, yes, yeah, so just wanted to say hi. Thank you for telling me where you're from. All right, so let's get to it. I have a lesson that um, is going to start with a little bit of backstory. Uh, I am going to go to this scene and say, um, all right, so there's a few things about being an internal medicine physician that I have not um, always said on my, my, um, on my YouTube um, channel, and that is um, internal medicine is about predicting the long game. You'll hear in the book when I write about my job is to say what happens when you have blood pressure for 10 years, when you have high, high or low cholesterol for a long time, what happens when those sugars are high for a long period of time. So when it comes to uh, some of the things that I've really been attracted to in my practice, it's been a brain that's working right and one that isn't working right. You'll um, see that there is a, a seminar that I give, one of my favorites. It's about 12 to 14 hours long, depending on the level of questions, um, that is all about how to heal a brain that's been injured. And whether that um, brain is from an injury, like a concussion, or whether it's from chronic illness or multiple sclerosis, you say, what are the things that we, we know that we could do to improve that brain? I've given a couple of teasers on this channel with a, a lecture about a month ago on BDNF, which was, again, the subtext of what are the rules for healing a, ketogen or healing a brain. 
When I first looked into the ketogenic diet, it was not to help my mom. I didn't consider it for helping somebody with cancer. Um, I was really looking at the fastest way that you can heal a brain. So it was in that brain injury, brain repair data that I found myself in the weeds and looking around saying, I need more examples, I need more evidence. And then of course my mother presented with this life or death situation where I had just barely been exposed to the cancer data and we walked through that together. That was over three years ago now. And I look at what, uh, what things my practice was doing before I introduced the ketogenic diet and um, what I've used uh, in those years to months of a ketogenic diet um, to help patients today. So um, you look at what happens when you start telling people that you help, peop you help an injured brain and you will find addiction. Uh, addiction medicine is uh, a whole subset of specialty in and of itself. Uh, but we have learned that um, it shouldn't just be one doctor, it needs to be a team of uh, physicians and therapists and um, clergy and family and community members trying to say, how do you heal a brain that's been addicted? Um, and as I look at some of the, the biggest traps in what is the long-term outcome for a ketogenic diet, I can't help but just be glaring uh, um, parallels to the same traps when I was trying to heal a brain from chronic alcohol or heal a brain from uh, chronic opiates. Uh, so we are going to use some of these parallels uh, and I will bring back the punchline here in a minute. So I am going to um, use this one uh, and oh maybe I'm not going to use this one. I can't see the picture of me on that one. Why? Oh maybe it's not on. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, so <laughs> you might have to uh, have that circle not have my face in it because <laughs> I don't know how to make that uh, cir circle come up. Let me just peek at something here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, check one more thing because I really would like to be, I'd like to have you see me in that circle. Um, but it might not. Um, so if we go here, if I go here, this is the best part about having made plenty of these mistakes before that I might be able to solve this without the help of my coach. Uh, <laughs> so I think it's uh, loading what I need it to load. Maybe not. So let's go here. Oh, shoot. Um, don't go away. I'm going to try this one more time. Uh, so you hopefully can hear me, even though you can't see me. And, and by that I mean uh, I am um, looking for, to do, let's see here, plus we're going to do a um, video capture. Um, Studio mode, so you can preview before you switch scenes. Oh, I can't do that right now, Jack. Uh, hold on, um, video capture, uh, okay. Hang tight, hang tight, I almost got it. I think I figured it out. Um, FaceTime camera, okay, but got it. Whew, sweet, okay. Now, take it small. Uh, oh, look at how good I've gotten at this, you guys. <laughs> this is sick, but true. Uh, almost there. Uh, you get to see what happens behind the scenes. <laughs> I don't care. I, I want you to be able to see this. So, okay. Now, that, the hard part's over. Now I just need to tell, <laughs> tell you what I was trying to do. Okay. When I look at some of the chronic illnesses that are caused, on the ketogen, uh, caused in uh, brain injuries, um, uh, one of those injuries has been a continued struggle with addiction. So as I look at one of the... Um, one of the places that I, I did a little education on my, my group this week, it's something called uh, mirror neurons. So mirror neurons are part of your brain and that brain uh, process uh, is very ingrained in mammals. 
Uh, mirror neurons have been around for probably most of my medical career. I can remember when it was first being talked about as if it were a new concept. Um, and uh, I, I was floored by how much credit was given to the mirror neurons uh, out of focus. Uh, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of small, isn't it? Um, so as I look at um, this, uh, this little monkey here, I'm going to show you that this, uh, let's see if I can make it bigger for you. I'm getting better at this all, every, <laughs> and by better I mean less than, less than uh, perfect, but uh, let's see if I can make that bigger for you. So I, I just want to say that monkey was at rest. When you look, uh, the next one had, uh, he was grasping a ball. And the last one is where the, the person who he's watching is grasping a ball. So these motor neurons, this one was what your nerves are doing at a, at a resting state. But if you look at the other two, the mirror neurons both fire when the monkey reached for the ball as well as when he reached, he saw someone else reach for the ball. These motor neurons are, again, a process of, let's see if I can make this smaller now, uh, a process of improving that, uh, that brain's uh, ability to not only uh, register what's happening, but how do we mimic behavior? You know, um, m this is another um, example of a motor neuron where when you watch a child mimic a, an adult, um, the, the motor neurons for this uh, child uh, started much younger when he was a baby. He would watch parents give a smile and he would smile. He would watch um, facial expressions and he would mimic those. Here's a great example of he's watching what his dad is doing and he's mimicking them. You say, well, what does this have to do with a ketogenic diet? This has to do with how do you sustain behavior that's new to you, especially when you're learning it as an adult or where, while you're learning it after your brain has been injured and maybe some of those neurons aren't going to conduct electricity even, even very well in the best of situations. You know, when I look at, um, when I look at addiction, um, I know that that brain really struggles to have um, the process of, um, uh, of learning to be, it's, it is not they willfully don't learn. It is a brain that really cannot connect uh, the, a message to a behavior as quickly as the rest of us. In part, their brain has very swollen neural pathways. Some of that has been the poor nourishment, the poor sleep. Uh, some of it's been from the chemicals. That alcohol will swell neural pathways. We now know that there is chronic swelling and uh, decreased BDNF with the, with the consumption of CBD as well as THC. Uh, I know that's a very popular thing, but w one of the best parts about science is when it starts to connect the dots and we can see it. I think it's our job as physicians, no matter how unpopular it is, to talk about uh, what happens when a brain can't heal and what are the things we can do to help it heal. Um, one of those swelling factors is sugar. So when I look at um, uh, the first six months or so that somebody's on a ketogenic diet, it's very similar to the first few months that somebody is in recovery. Uh, recovery from addiction that has a very common label, like an opiate or alcohol. And they begin to say, life does feel better on the other side. Uh, I do feel the rejuvenation of how my energy used to be. I feel like I'm sleeping better. I feel like I'm thinking better. But then those addiction patients get to a journey where life gets hard and it's either, sometimes it's a happiness. They feel like they're celebrating and then they don't know how to celebrate with control. They ended up with uh, returning to an addiction where they really escaped the moment. Um, when I look at the, the, the danger of um, addiction in that second or third month, it's a similar thing that I find when people have been in the ketogenic diet for um, about, I don't know, sometimes it's about the second month or the third month. So it's a little longer with the ketones, with the sugar. And I don't know if it's just that, you know, the brains are actually a little healthier than they were with some of the addiction patients. But when I, uh, when I watch to see how um, they can pick up new behaviors, and then how well do those behaviors last? When you have um, uh, mirror neurons, uh, those mirror neurons are saying, oh, wow, I just saw a friend of mine go through a struggle, and they really did lean on their community and their church, 
And those behaviors are something, even if they've never done them before, their brain suddenly has a memory that that might be a resource for them to use in the future. And I find that on Friday mornings, I lead a keto group. And what I'm doing at this keto group, I can't help but uh, identify that how powerful that teach those lessons are each week and how much I am reminded of the addiction groups that I would run when I had a full um, addiction clinic. Um, so I want to I want to go to these questions and uh, and show you. Uh, we're going to turn this one off. Uh, criterion for addiction. So I'm going to show you. And this again, I, I have small, but I'm going to make it much bigger. But I wanted to start out by saying there's a there's a handbook for addiction for substance use disorder. Uh, the the little acronym is DSM-5. But really what um, this is, is the rule book to say, as physicians, as providers, we are all going to use the same set of rules to decide if somebody is addicted to something or not. And, and part of having the discussion about the neuro, uh, the, the mirror neurons at the beginning is to say, we know that mirror neurons are a big part of how we help people stay in recovery is to activate them. But let's just back it up a second and say, do you really think that, uh, that sugar could be used as in the diagnostic criteria for um, for for what we would would be using for alcohol, opiates, um, crystal meth, uh, heroin, all of them. Uh, so I'm going to blow this up a little bit so that you can see it better and show you that there is a first of all the uh, let's see here. Gonna unlock that. There we go. Uh, and we're going to scroll up. Just, so according to DSM-5, a substance use disorder may be an appropriate diagnosis when at least two of the following characteristics occur within a 12-month period. So I use this a lot when I'm talking with um, patients, but I will. we're going to blow this up and just go one by one and compare that with how we see addiction in sugar. So number one is the quantity of the substance used or the amount of time spent using is often greater than intended. So it only takes a few visits to a keto group, especially our keto group, where we say we find somebody recently uh, getting to the part where they've been a, on a ketogenic diet for maybe two weeks. Um, they're in that zone where the hunger level goes down and they're still eating three times a day. Now, maybe it's because they, they notice they're not losing weight. And in part, uh, I try to get them to really reflect and say, so you're not losing weight, but I wonder, do you have, um, do you have that habit of eating more often than you should? Uh, how often are you thinking about food? And have you been able to let go of that process of eating? You know, maybe they were lucky enough they were only eating three times a day, but most Americans eat five times a day. They put snacks in the middle, they have a coffee with lots of sugar in it, and before you know it, that's five different times in a day that they put calories into their system. So when we look at criteria to say, is somebody really addicted? Uh, that, uh, and, and then you, then you follow it with the word sugar, and you can offend a lot of people. Uh, so the first one is, do they ever find themselves spending more time than intended uh, thinking and processing, when am I going to eat next? And I contend that you don't really notice how much time you spend planning your next meal until you get to that part where you're just eating one a day, one meal a day, or maybe it's two meals a day, but you're fascinated by how much more time is in the day. So sometimes they won't, won't notice this. I'll tell you my biggest revelation was the first time I went 36 hours without eating. And first of all, I was floored how much more time, how many times I thought about food, but then when I wasn't planning food, when I wasn't gonna be eating, there was just a lot more space in my day. So the next one is efforts to control use of substances are unsuccessful due to persistent desire for a substance. Now, when you're an alcoholic, you can say, yep, they drink and then they stop drinking and then they think about the, the alcohol and that's what makes them an alcoholic. But I would contend that anytime your brain has really relied on the dopamine that comes from a substance, and by golly, if you think that your brain doesn't make dopamine when you have sugar, take it away after being on it for several years. So anybody who's transitioned for the last, um, uh, you know, 
two or three weeks of not having sugar uh, find themselves in an irritable moment and suddenly the thoughts of a candy bar or, or sugar or that sweet coffee drink that you love is it's just like the only thought that you can find in your head. If somebody makes cookies and brings them to my office, um, well, they don't do that very often anymore, but they used to. And it would be a thought where the patient is talking to me and my brain would go to those cookies saying, what's wrong with me? Why am I thinking about that? So as we go to the next one, um, consider um, the, uh, considerable time is spent using the substance and recovering from the effects. Again, uh, if you've ever had uh, five or six meals a day, uh, that is a considerable amount of your day spent eating. That would be an easy criteria for most patients that are on the ketogenic diet now to look back and say, boy, we really did have a lot of time spent there. The next one is a strong desire or cravings. Uh, uh, strong desire, craving, or urge to use the substance um, is present and you can talk to any one of us to see that that has been true. Substance use interferes with the major role or obligations at work, school, or home. This is a little harder criteria to hit, but I will tell you, I have plenty of patients who say, Doc, that's totally me, that's what I do. Uh, the use of substances continues despite the harmful social or interpersonal effects caused uh, or made worse by the substance use. So with alcoholism, you can see that it's socially inappropriate to drink it in certain areas, and if you get intoxicated or show up in areas that you're intoxicated, you'll have consequences of driving a vehicle. With sugar, we don't have those social rules, but as soon as you enter into what Jerry is struggling with, which is, I was gonna do one meal every other day, I know that it's really good for me, my numbers are so much better, but as I enter the realm of the relationships that I really appreciate, it's, it is a constant pushback to say, what do you mean you're not gonna eat for 48 hours in between? And that sounds like this outrageous goal. Um, so let's just do a couple, and we'll, we'll speed through these. Uh, the substance use occurs in situations uh, which are physically hazardous. Uh, you could look to Jerry as, again, another example, saying for years his sugars were high and his doctor was saying, we gotta get them down. Uh, well, you're gonna use medicine, we're gonna use insulin, we're gonna do anything possible to get you to get those sugars down. Um, it wasn't until the ketogenic diet that we really saw that flip. Um, so uh, getting next is the tolerance of the substance, the tolerance of sugar and how much that really does interface with their cravings. Um, um, they, they achieve intoxication. <laughs> and you can say that, that's, that, isn't, that isn't what happens with sugar, but I will tell you times where I've been, um, especially if I've fasted for like three or four days, and then I go to eat and I sometimes celebrate too much, I have too much of the, sh of the sugar. Um, that hasn't happened probably in six or eight months, but I, this was a common problem uh, earlier in my, um, in my uh, kind of journey of keto, keto living. And I would just say, I deserve, and then fill in the blank. And I would, I would think of those rewarding sugar uh, treats if I would fast for four days or do something that was you know, a new goal for me. Not nearly understanding that the recovery of my swollen brain and my slowed thinking uh, was so profound that I could, not, uh, I could not have described that that was what was happening to me uh, until I spent time without it happening to me. And boy, I find that same... Um, those same explanations coming from my, my patients with uh, heroin or with uh, opiates or with alcohol. Uh. All right, so let's do one more. After heavy or sustained use of the substance, substance, reduction in or abstinence from the substance results in withdrawal symptoms uh, and precipitates the resumption of use of the substance or similar substance to relieve or avoid withdrawal symptoms. Again, when you look at that, that lull after you've had sugar, and, and you can only imagine, um, you know, I've talked about how sugar will shoot your energy up and then shoot it down, and it will shoot your energy up and shoot it down. On that way down is when people start to say, boy, I'd like some more of that quick, easy glucose fuel. And you can see them uh, kind of whirlwind into a behavior of, you know, Doc, I did really good on that ketogenic diet, and then I did not have um, any... Um, 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 
uh, like will to say no to sugar after I'd been off of it for uh, you know three weeks. I, I I knew that my body needed it. It was a signal from my body that I needed it. And I really I I warn patients that that is a trap. That is again that is a hormonal craving. Your brain has been wired to have that dopamine surge and that glucose time and time again. When I look at the the dangerous part of um, patients having a uh, an addiction and and you look at what do I think the key is to a sustainable ketogenic diet. Number one, I tell folks you need to be well educated before you start. There are some hiccups for people with chronic illnesses. Uh, this channel does a lot of those. How do you prepare for a ketogenic diet if you're really unhealthy? Um, but the sustainable, the most important part for the long game, how do you stay in recovery for 20 years? How do you stay away from the temptation for the, from now until your grave? and that is a support group. Um, we need to ignite your motor, your mirror neurons to watch what happens as we gather each Friday morning and we talk about how have you been. Sometimes I'll give a little lesson, but many times uh, it, it is really just using the, one another's stories to share and say, here's what happened, here's what I did, uh, you know what, it was not even a time of confession, just saying here's how I got through a struggle, here's how I, um, here's how I educated my neighbor. So just little things that you have, you have no example in your life currently that says, well, how does somebody go through recovery? Uh, a recovery of something they crave, something they've used as energy, and almost shamefully, it's socially acceptable to continue sugar. Unlike chronic alcoholics or heroin users or crystal meth uh, users, they really don't have society behind them saying that's going to be a good idea. But boy, with sugar you do. And that chronic uh, brain patterns of I have learned to say that when I'm irritated, when I'm stressed, when I'm happy, when I'm lonely, when I'm uh, disappointed, all of those become a place where they pour in a chemical that they know they're going to get a response from. And they won't get as much dopamine as they used to from sugar, but by adding sugar every two to three hours, they now have a chronic inflamed body because their insulin is chronically high. And to undo that, we need to stop. We need to stop adding sugars. And that is really what a ketogenic diet does. So I've put out a few challenges over the last few weeks to say, if you start your own <laughs> support group, uh, I will do my best to join you to answer some questions, whether it's through a, um, a screen share or whatever way, FaceTime, whatever, whatever it is that your, your keto group is, has technology to use, I'll find a way to use it. Uh, but it's really in support of saying, don't make it a place. I like Overeaters Anonymous. That's actually what they talk about. I don't think they're very keto supportive yet, but uh, I would expect that if you look at the long game for people who have continually used um, uh, sugar for dopamine, um, sugar for uh, their, their satisfaction of self-soothing, that the behaviors I teach to my chronic addiction patients are the same ones we're going through on Friday mornings for folks who've had chronic addiction in their own uh, sugar journey. So when I say what is the most important long game for a ketogenic diet, I come back to saying you've got to have relationships with people showing you how to get through a struggle that you don't have anybody imprinting you with that behavior. You can read about it in a book, but it is nothing like what's activated in a mirror neuron, which is what we worked really hard in our addiction clinic to do, showing people that the mistakes were places where you would forgive yourself for those tough decisions. You would forgive your, your, your group mate for those tough decisions, and those two emotions were similar, meaning the amount of grace you could give yourself when you went through a difficult time is actually the amount of grace that you have for somebody else who is struggling. And boy, that's a difficult thing to really example, uh, but is again and again, when we look at the difference between somebody who's a dry drunk, who, you know, they don't drink alcohol anymore, but they're crabby and they're irritable and they're very judgmental and they just kind of white knuckle how to not drink anymore, but nobody wants to be around that. Uh, we see those behaviors come alive when people give up their coping skills of sugar. When people say you cannot uh, have a sustainable um, group that is um, that is w w that is a lifetime without glucose, 
Uh, what I think they're saying is they've never seen an example of that. So I, I host one for free in my community, and I'm asking you to do that. Just like Alcoholics Anonymous, you have uh, your tax dollars support things like churches and libraries and community rooms that you should be able to say, as long as you're not charging money for them, those are supposed to be free to the public. That's our tax dollars at work. And there can be some rules and limitations, but boy, I have just haven't found a community yet where we, where we didn't come up with an idea of where they could have their meeting. And the purpose of the meeting is to come and to gather and to share and to wake up those things called mirror neurons saying, here's what I did when I fell off the wagon. And I fell off the wagon 15 times before I figured out how to say no. And this is what I used. And even though you can read about those things in a book, there is something powerful about our human brains, about our primate brains that say, as soon as somebody showed me that, I was able to use that so much more. And I really am about saying, Tomorrow morning, there is actually somebody who reached out saying, we've had our keto group a few times. Would you mind popping in for 15 minutes? So I changed my schedule and said, I'm going to honor my, my um, commitment that I said I would do this and try to be there for um, uh, the improvement in their performance. All right, so um, I'm going to go back to one more, th one more uh, little question here, and that is um, I... Let's see, I think that will take that away. And I know Jack has a much better way uh, of doing this, but th these are also the dimensions that um, when I look at how, how uh, much did this addiction affect my patient? And with that, we use these dimensions to say, um, how many resources do we think it will take to help them really get into the long life of recovery? Number one, are they acutely intoxicated or going through withdrawal at the time we meet? And yeah, that sounds funny until you have been to the carb world and then you're like, guess what? That isn't, that isn't funny. <laughs> uh, let's go here, um, dimensions, here we go. Uh, so the next one is biomedical conditions and complications. So, uh, you know, when alcoholics have had years of alcoholism that their liver enzymes are elevated or that their body has uh, poor nerve conduction in their fingers, then we start to identify that we're going to need a medical team to help that alcoholic really find a life of recovery. Uh, the next one is the dimension three is emotional, uh, behavioral, or cognitive conditions. And um, as much as uh, that seems obvious by this part of the lecture that when we come together on Friday, it's not really to say, here's the rules of what you do. It is as much about that as it is, how can I um, learn from others' mistakes, others' journeys? I think one of the best testimonies I've seen is, I was coming to this keto group for several months. I was frustrated. I just listened for the first several times I came what I noticed was in some places my journey was mu much stronger than the ones in front of me, but in other places they gave me an example of how to kind of crack the code of how do I get through this and stay in ketosis, stay in the ketogenic diet. Um, the other things are um, readiness to change. If people do not want to change this behavior, you're not going to cajole them or trick them into doing it. You're really, they really have to want an improvement of their health. Um, this is the relapse conditions. This is one of the ways we look at relapse conditions and the recovery for a living environment is what are the resources they have after they have sobered up? After you get rid of carbs, what do you do next? And that sounds like an easy thing um, to answer, but it absolutely isn't. It is a powerful journey to say, oh, I did keto for a few weeks, I felt great, but then I fell off and I guess I just stopped. And do you know how many alcoholics have given me that exact same story? You know, Doc, I, I quit for a while, but then something happens and I have one drink and then it turns into 10. And those same stories happen with cookies, <laughs> happen with carbs, happen with um, that highly addictive processed food and what it does to our cravings and our brains to want more. So I, I look at this, uh, this, um, this journey of what do I think the most important thing is for the long game for the sustainability of a ketogenic diet and that is the same thing I tell my addiction patients in other substances you've got to have a circle of support you've got to have a place that you can go and say I messed it up here I am again I'm trying again and that needs to be safe so um, I try to provide that for my community. I'm doing everything in my power. Uh, as much as uh, the business model does not 
play out the best uh, in, in in canceling schedules. I really want this to be uh, exampled for other people. And I think if you see how a support group can work, um, <laughs> if you need examples, find somebody that goes to an AA meeting that works. Uh, some of the AA meetings don't work because of the leadership, but a lot of them do because they've got examples of a safe place to come, tell their story, and connect with people who've been igniting those mirror neurons for a long period of time. Uh, so I, I hope you can see what I was uh, trying to get to. Thanks for the forgiveness of the little bit of hiccup on my, my, my mirror there. I do have a shout out for my mother. So I don't know that she's watching. She tries to watch on Sunday nights, but um, I have prepared something for her. I am going to try and um, um, uh, to click over here. We're gonna do one more of these. I know I just said I was done with this page, but um, I am going to show her this. Okay, so there is something that, um, oh, actually I was gonna teach this first. So if you are starting a support group, one of the things I really want folks to realize is you do not need money to start a support group. Uh, there are a couple playlists on my channel that I have specifically designed to be short, very low attention span needed, the basics in how to learn about the ketogenic diet, and it allows you to watch them at home. You can use them as a discussion point for when you do gather, watching one of those two or three minutes saying, what did you learn? What do you think she's talking about? Did it make sense? Um, so I, when you get on my channel, if you click on that word playlists, um, and then uh, you can see that there are a list of playlists, a whole bunch of them. Um, what I like to, to take notice of is, let me see here. Um, go to um, list of playlists. Okay, here we go. Uh, so th this is what I want you to see. Um, so you can, you can see that little, um, the one that says play all, and it says beginners, all things keto, and you can kind of see a little superhero behind that. Um, I'll, I'll blow that up for you here. Um, uh, once you push that, actually this is what that is. Once you push that, uh, this little, um, it's got a little superhero. It's the only one that's red. <laughs> so I tried to make it different than everything else. So it is, it got a thumbnail that's got a red background. If you click on that, that playlist is meant for people who are just trying to have a support group. They're looking for some curriculum maybe to use to not have to lift the whole thing about teaching about a ketogenic diet. Um, sometimes when folks are struggling, the last thing you need to do is give them more to do. Um, when you click on that though, you can see the numbering over here of one, two, three, four, and there's actually 44 of them. These are the basics for the ketogenic diet. How do you, what do you think about when you begin? I'll tell you that um, number two on that playlist is an interview between Grandma Rose and I when she had just had another milestone after the book was published and I just wanted to share it with everybody. I've put it on there just to say, here, it's not just for the young. She was 71 and she, she was acting 90 something because her body was so struggling with that inflammation. And I just think that is a really encouraging video. <laughs> we were kind of silly about it at the beginning, kind of like a lot of my videos, but uh, wonderful uh, testimony to say, you do not need to be um, the, you know, the youngest one in the group to start this. Um, that is a very uh, important thing. So here's the thing that I was gonna show Grandma Rose. Okay, my mom has been looking for <laughs> this bell because if you ring that bell, if you push that bell, once you've subscribed to my channel, um, you will see that um, the bell uh, then gives you an alert that I put out a new video. <laughs> so my mother's like, I don't know where this bell is. So I said, well, I will show you on the channel that that bell, when you push it, it will send you a message saying, all right, I have another video out. Um, that's uh, usually something that happens on Sundays, but there are some micro clips that I put out for folks that can't, can't really take the time for a full hour. Um, I've found people really do enjoy the, um, the, um, the use of the, uh, the playlists. And then there's one of them that's got type one diabetes. I really, I've had lots of people who've said, I just don't know what to do about my insulin. I say, I can't give you advice uh, over, the, over YouTube, but you can watch what I did with one of my type one diabetics and see what she did. 
um, that her name is Lachlan. That playlist is, again, type 1 diabetes is the kind where you have to inject insulin. She doesn't make it anymore. Uh, Lachlan did not get diabetes until she was in her 30s. She'd had two babies. She had some other autoimmune things happening, and the type 1 diabetes was a complete life wreck for this uh, young mother trying to do it all. <laughs> and you know what? I have been so proud of her for how much her insulin is down to under 30 units a day. Her sugars are so much better. I can't wait to return to her endocrinologist and just be there to watch how much her A1C had been 10, 10 point something, 11 point something. That's average sugars in the 300s. And you know, that sounds really like, oh, that's terrible. But you can't believe the number of type ones who've just said, I'm doing the best I can. Their brain is swollen. Their mirror neurons have nobody else around them saying, how do you undo insulin? How do you lower insulin? And she had over 150 units of insulin that she had per day uh, with multiple shots. Now she's down to one shot per day. It's under 30 units a day. And you just can't believe the difference in the transformation. So if you are type 1 uh, and you're looking for an example, those mirror neurons aren't as good as if you had your own support group, but it'll get you started for some good information. So I am going to take this time to answer a couple of questions. So thank you uh, for uh, staying tuned for the biggest majority of the education. I will tell you that anybody out there that is trying to, to start their support group, I like to see that you've had a couple of meetings before you invite me in, just to see that you've got some rhythm. But I do want to be as encouraging as possible to those who are just you know, learning. What does it look like to have um, uh, a support group and am I doing it right and there are no rules it is be nice uh, uh, you know no gossiping no uh, nothing that said at the support group should ever leave the support group uh, outside of an educational platform to say this is what I learned at my support group this is what I learned from that YouTube channel or uh, as such all right so um, I am gonna just scroll through I know that um, the the um, comments are coming there over on the side and, um, oh, there's a good question about leptin. Kristen M. Okay, do you, do you have to reset your leptin with a carb, uh, a carb day? And I would say no. Um, leptins and uh, their, uh, so just, just a little bit of recap. Leptin is one of the hormones in your body that is um, produced when you feel full, when you have that satiety. Um, if you look at people with high levels of leptin, I often describe if you've ever been to a church and you've got the same family that sits in that pew week after week after week and they are all like skinny, no body, their body doesn't make fat cells or something. They're just really lean um, one after the other and you think, oh my gosh, they have great genetics. And they probably do have some, some benefits in their genetics, but they probably have really high leptin. Uh, the other things that I would bet they do is their leptin uh, is high because they probably sit down and eat as a family. They probably do not eat sugar. In, they probably do not drink sugar, meaning their, their drinks are usually calorie free. Um, they uh, likely have smaller size plates. They don't have big plates. They have smaller size plates. Uh, and again, they don't eat on the run. They sit together as a family and eat. Those are just some of the side effect benefits that increase the chances that you'll be lean. Um, the other uh, part of having a, a leptin that's uh, much uh, lower is, or much higher is um, it doesn't take a lot for them to feel full. So when looking at the ways leptin does increase, it has a very strong connection to a hormone called cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin only listens for your body's consumption of fat. Um, uh, I love the way Jason Fung, Dr. Jason Fung talks about this. He says, have you ever had one of those times where you're at a family event and you eat some pork chops and with some heavy, like fattening gravy on it and you're so full you cannot take another bite? And then somebody sets key lime pie in front of you or something you love. Um, and you say, oh yeah, suddenly I was hungry again or I could eat that, but you put the fat in front of me and I couldn't eat that. Cholecystokinin measures or it keeps track of how much um, uh, your body's fat has how much you've eaten. And once cholecystokinin is on the rise, it also talks to your brain, increases the leptin, uh, and you feel full, you feel satisfied. 
there is no hormone that, that processes the amount of carbohydrates you've eaten. So you cannot actually feel a hormonal fi uh, signal that says, hey, you've had enough carbs, you should stop eating. We don't have one of those. So when people say, do you think that you should have some carbs to increase that leptin? I would contend no. I think there are plenty of other ways your body can get carbohydrates. I think that once you're at your ideal body weight, your lean you know, body mass index of 23.5 or somewhere around there, then you can talk to me a little bit more about, could I have some carbs? And I will then remind you that carbs should come in seasons, like a seasonal food. Uh, but again, this is not for the people who are still not at a body mass index of 23.5. I am not at a body mass, mass index of 23.5. I mean, I screwed up. I have plenty of other ways that I've said, okay, this is, this is where my journey is and this is how I'm hoping to get there. But the, the ability for leptin to be reset by carbohydrates, I would say I would not recommend that. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, I'm gonna scroll through a couple of them. There was one that passed a minute ago that I wanna read out loud. Um, Um, okay, so uh, there is a, someone named GGM who says, I have a question about how to end a long fast. Um, like she's doing a five day one right now, have heard fat, no protein, then heard protein, then heard keto meal. <laughs> okay, so let's just remind you that what happens during a longer fast, again, uh, for those of you new to this channel, I fast every week. Um, we do a lot of things on this channel to talk about um, the um, Dr. Ba's ratio, again, we're trying to measure autophagy and how can we ignite the cellular repair, get rid of some free radicals, really improve the inflammation status of our bodies. And that doesn't happen by accident. I, it is a measurable process. Um, the Dr. Ba's ratio I reach for every week on my fast is to get below 40. Um, I have been uh, blessed with um, so enough followers on Instagram to reach uh, even more. Um, so thank you for those of you that do follow me on Instagram. I've just put the link there. I post my numbers each week on Instagram and then give some explanations about what I think is happening. Last week's fast was fascinating. I even posted after my fast was over, I posted a number saying I've never had numbers as good. And I talk about what I think was going on during that fast in those Instagram posts. So if you don't have Instagram, I would recommend it. It really is um, one of those places where you can follow people. And what, my, what I use Instagram for is finding other people who are using the Dr. Boz ratio, but also giving you an example of what I do. So in the event that Gigi gets to her at the end of a five day fast and you say, well, what should I do to break the fast? I want you to imagine the inside of your gut lining. Um, again, you have food that works its way through it, your gut uh, and from, from mouth to anus, it's got a journey and there are different sections that are responsible for different signals throughout, your, throughout the traveling part of that food. When you fast, and I'm talking, you are less than a fourth of a cup of bone broth or um, some Himalayan salt, some black coffee or some water. That's what I call fasting. Um, eventually, the bone broth isn't as needed. Sometimes for those longer fasts, like a five-day fast, a, a, cup, a fourth of a cup of bone broth on that third or fourth day is uh, especially really salty. So I think of it as just another way to deliver the salt for somebody that's that far into a fast. But if you look at what happens to those cells, they have really shut down, like they got a rest for one of the, you know, you, you don't get much of a rest for your bowels. We eat most of the time, we eat all the time unless there's a famine. And so to have a fast, you really have shut down that bowel. And now you're going to wake it up again. So I recommend that you do get that bone broth and you fill it up to a half a cup. And you sip on that for about two hours before the, next, before the real meal. When you do have a meal, um, don't do what I do. <laughs> I love food, so when I break a fast, I often prepare a feast <laughs> and I eat way too much. Um, your gut will tell you if you eat way too much. And anybody who's done a longer fast uh, that has um, uh, you know, really struggled with uh, where, um, where they're doing their, they're breaking their fast because they wanna be close to a toilet uh, is usually because they are eating far more than they need to. Uh, it is currently one of my little things I'm working on is to say, <laughs> I get so proud of myself for fasting that I plan this uh, celebration meal. Uh, 
I've been now fasting for about 36 to 48 to sometimes 72 hours every week for over a year. So I'm not nearly as bad as I used to be, but there's still a little part of me that says, I deserve this. <laughs> so that addiction, it's real. And those, those people inside my uh, support group, even though I'm the leader of the one that I, ha I host, they teach me saying, nope, I was able to do it. I was able to just have a regular meal with my family and I didn't get the GI upset. Uh, so Gigi, my answer to you is start with um, bone broth. If you're looking for a good recipe of the bone broth, it's in that book. It gels every time. Uh, there's a great little blog post that it links you to on the internet if you're looking for it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will uh, again start my fast today. I, I, I do this once a week uh, in hopes to ignite autophagy, but really to be an example of mirror neurons for you. Uh, although mirror neurons are only ignited when you're in person, we think. So um, it's going to be as close as we're going to get for most of you, but I will push you to start your support group and really activate those mirror neurons and then invite me to just pop in and answer some questions to say, how can we create a, a not just a country, but if you look at the where, where folks are from as you watch this channel, it is a globe of people saying, I want my health back. How is it possible? And it's stories like Jerry's, who at 68 years old says, I, I need to fix this. And he gets on YouTube and he, and he searches out and he reads a book and he changes his health and he loses 70 pounds. And he gets off of insulin, even though I'm not quite sure that was perfectly timed yet. Uh, but he's willing to say, I could go 48 hours without a meal now that I feel this good. Uh, again, I wouldn't have recommended that the first couple of months for Jerry, but he is seven months into his keto journey. We're going to hear from Jerry, uh, Jerry in the upcoming weeks. And once again, I will... Um, um, I will, I was just reading one of the comments that are saying, oh, that would be a good one too, but I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to sign off. Uh, I will, I have actually some homework to do for kids, uh, so I'm going to go back to uh, being mom uh, until tomorrow morning, and I will be tuning into a couple of support groups this week. Thank you for uh, uh, following me. Oh, actually, there was one other thing. There was one uh, person I told I would give her an answer. Oh, I forgot to do this. I'm going to do this now. Okay. Um, oh. Okay, so this is, there was somebody who asked me, tell me again the difference between BHB and MCT. Uh, I am going to uh, push play and do this. This will only take like two minutes. I think it's worth it because I promised her I would do this and I totally forgot to do it. Dang it. Okay, so here is play. Um, all right, so ketones. You, knowing the difference between BHB and MCT is really a big deal for those beginners. Um, so BHB, uh, those are the products that I sell with BHB. I use um, um, one of the brand regulated uh, BHB products, um, meaning I pay a lot more money for my BHB and my MCT. Um, all right, so BHB is a salt. So if you are a newbie, BHB, beta hydroxybutyrate, it is a salt. When you put it in, uh, they are ready-made ketones. They are absorbed rather quickly, and when you put them in, they shoot way up. I've had people say, my ketones went to 9, 9.5 uh, when I took that BHB. Is that dangerous? I'm like, keep checking. It goes down. What your body doesn't use, you will pee out. <laughs> you will get rid of. It only lasts a couple of hours. But I have my newbies say, if you're looking for... Um, activation of your metabolism. And last week's fast is a really, my, my fast on, on, in, on Instagram does a good job of saying what happens when we help people with their metabolism. Um, these BHB salts really are a good place for beginners to start. Um, and then once your gut has, is able to tolerate these, we can go on to the next step. Uh, those two products there, the, the Keto BHB um, is actually got, um, it's got some stevia in it. The capsules have no stevia in it. So when you look at this, I want you to eat your ketones. Just let the supplement do the work. And for my patients who are type, uh, type 2 diabetic with high levels of sugars and high levels of insulin, boy, it is a lot of equations we're, ma we're managing to try and get their ketone uh, production started. So it is this supplement that I used with Lachlan. She was a type one diabetic. She has sugars uh, close to 300 when we started. And I said, I want you to keep doing everything just as you're doing, but you're gonna put this in your body every day. Had we had the capsules, I would have had her put like, because of her weight, I would have probably had her put five capsules in every three hours. 
Now, I don't take pills very well, I meaning I just don't like that. Um, so the supplement, as much as I didn't like stevia, I would probably have chose the supplement for me. Uh, you can get away with the supplement, you can sip on it so it lasts longer. And you can uh, then just check your ketones to make sure you're producing ketones. So you're shooting for a ketone, blood ketone level of 1.0. And as long as that was the level, they really did seem to activate their metabolism. And then when we cut their carbs, we did amazing. MCT is your other option. This is a fat. This is not a salt. It is much different and it does take a little bit of knowledge to understand what it's doing. You will have the MCT go in. It slips through your gut, meaning you do not have to digest it. It is absorbed. So you can start seeing it in the gut in about 30 minutes. I mean, excuse me, in the blood in about 30 minutes. And the way you measure that is, again, measure those blood ketones. The blood ketones, um, you will slip these... Uh, these special little fats into the absorption, it goes right into the liver, and those fats then uh, turn into ketones. Your, the mitochondria within the liver will spit out ketones for up to six hours. So these are ready-made ketones, not ready-made ketones. Ready-made ketones are the ones in a salt, the BHB salt. These are ketones that your body will make. So again, the benefits of the MCT C8, C10 are that you have, um, you spark your liver to produce ketones for several hours. Oops, I think there was another thing there. Um, so I told somebody I would go through that um, in, um, uh, in tonight's live. So there it is for you. I'm sorry it took me so long, or I forgot about it. The key that I wanted to go over is she was brand new. She has really high sugars, and she's every time she takes in some MCT, she gets an awful GI upset. And I'm like, you are asking your gut to do way too many things at first. Start with the salts. Do it for two weeks. Just stay stable. I like my patients to be checking their numbers. That is a really helpful way to say, could we gift you? Uh, could we make sure that you're getting that metabolism started? And that is, did you measure? This is not a guess. This is actually very well looked at. So have enough ketones that you take in that you can see um, those, um, those ketones in circulation. Once they're stable, once they have that metabolism better, they're eating keto, uh, adding a little bit, um, um, adding a little bit of that MCT C8, C10 can be helpful. Now, these supplements are not for everybody. Uh, I use them whenever I fall off the wagon. <laughs> I think of them as my recovery, get me back to feeling better. Um, uh, some people don't need any supplements, but there are a lot of people out there whose metabolism is so sick, much like what I write about in the book. My mother uh, was very sick. Uh, she couldn't, she was producing as many ketones as her little body could produce, but she had so much cortisol from the stress and the cancer and the chemo and the surgery and all the things that went wrong that the supplements were the only way that we could get her back to a scientifically proven, okay, are we helping her metabolism or am I hurting? And, you know, the book does a better job of uh, going through that, but um, if you want to see what happens when you add ketone supplements to somebody who's keto adapted, I'm very keto adapted. Um, last week on my live, I drank ketones um, uh, in a supplement, and then I watched what they did over the next uh, day or so. And the supplement's only going to last for like a few hours, so it wasn't working the next day, but watch what it did to my metabolism. It blew my mind, actually. All right, I went over a little bit, but I hope you appreciate it, and I'm glad I remembered to do that for that patient. So thank you again, and I will see you next week uh, with hopefully no glitches on sound or production. Until next week, I am improving your health one ketone at a time. Signing off, Dr. Boz.